Good evening. We're going to start off with a couple of introductions from Emmy, Lolita, and Sandy. So if you could quickly just introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your professional and personal endeavors. Hello, everyone. My name is Emmy Hernandez, and I am the CEO of Startup Life Coach. I am a new resident to Omaha. I come from uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley. And uh, there I did a lot of international training. So I was teaching tech entrepreneurs how to take the technology or the idea that they had, kind of like heady, and figure out if there was a market for that. So how to actually get paid. And uh, it's not always patents. Uh, that's actually only a small percentage of how to get paid. So that's what I was teaching. And I ran some of those courses at UC Berkeley UCSF, a lot of my clients were from Stanford, and I also did some international work in Mexico, Uruguay, and Tunisia in, the northern, in northern Africa. And now here in Omaha, I'm running some programs in Lincoln and Farwell where I'm running a virtual boot camp. So doing this same training that I did internationally, but specifically for people in Nebraska working on agricultural products. So whether they're new technology ideas, or whether it's working with cattle, uh, we're figuring out how to get people in Nebraska the help because they're usually ignored by the investors on the coast because agriculture is not sexy, but we're making it sexy. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. My name is Lolita Robinson, and I am the CEO and founder of Fortis Industries. And this company is a full-service healthcare technology management company, and we basically supply and provide medical equipment, replacement parts. Um, we do maintenance and repair services around medical equipment and training. Um, we sell primarily to the U.S. federal government, but also we sell internationally as well, particularly in Africa. So I started the business about oh, five, six years ago because when I was living over in Tanzania, I was seeing a lot of patients that were just kind of sitting around, milling around outside of cancer centers and clinics, and they're all just waiting for someone to replace a part for medical equipment, for a CT scan, MRI, or something, and they were sick and dying out in the field. And so I said, you know, there's something that can be done in order to train people to become technicians, but also provide better health care, better medical equipment to these populations. So that's what I've been doing. Um, I moved here um, from Maryland about two years ago. So this has been a different winter experience for me. And, so <laughs> and I've learned you know, to avoid potholes sometimes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sandy Barr. I'm a senior software engineer with a company called PRX. We are a public media company. and. Most of our work is uh, surrounded around promoting diverse and underrepresented voices in the podcasting and public radio uh, industry. So uh, part of wh what my work is there is to build applications for people putting their podcasts online and uh, promoting our network called Radiotopia. So um, I've been in Omaha as a software engineer all of my adult life, worked for several <coughs> companies around town and worked with uh, several programs to try to uh, promote programs for underrepresented folks in the industry as well as as uh, being a woman in the in the field is not not very popular so it's something that I think you know you really need a lot of support to do so I really appreciate uh, those of you who are also you know forging your own paths and and uh, you know blazing trails so I Tell us about your, what, what you're doing, Margarita. Sure. <laughs> I am moderator for tonight, Margaretha McLean Artist. I've been in the Omaha, Nebraska area for about nine years now, originally from Ohio. I moved here after I completed a master's in biochemistry and nutritional sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I was recruited by ConAgra Foods and worked as a scientist for them for a couple of years, and then also as a scientist and an engineer for Nestle. Um, I left the corporate world in 2000. 17 and purchase a child care and learning center. We have child care and um, learning opportunities for infants, toddlers, and pre-K preschool. Um, one of our main focuses is STEM and STEM education for ages three through five. Okay, let's get started with some of those questions. Now, if, if one or two of you can just tell us your immediate reaction to the movie and also tell us some of the interesting parts um, that you saw in the film. Okay. 
Um, yeah, this is actually my third time actually watching the movie. So every time I, I see it, I see something different that I didn't recognize mm -hmm. the other two times. And for me, I feel like, you know, being a woman in this sort of science field or medical health care, at times you're often not taken seriously, you know, and I find myself in meetings where it's all male and I can tell you several times I've gone in as a business owner and they're just kind of like, when's your boss coming in, you know, and so I, so for me to kind of watch her and what she's going through when she's always trying to be who she is and what she's about and stay true to herself in these de male dominated situations, it's very hard and um, but you just kind of have to keep going through and forging through and trying your best. Yeah, I really appreciate that uh, last point that you said, especially uh, you really do have to keep doing your best. Your best is good enough and you should give your best to the world because it's what we have to offer, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is for me the biggest takeaway <coughs> of the film is that you know, you're not always going to find the e easy path, but you've got you've to move forward. Do we have any audience questions? Yes. Hold we'll, uh, on. We'll there's there's going to be a mic coming to you. Um, do you think if Hetty hadn't been so beautiful, that maybe she would have been taken more seriously? Or do you think just being a woman back in that time, it didn't really matter? I think that um, she really used her beauty as an opportunistic way to promote herself, and I do um, agree with I think what you're, the lines of what you're thinking is that, you know, when you're so forwardly glamorous, that's what people think of you even today. Um, but I I really recognize what she was going for in the ways that she put herself. In, in front of people as that glamorous woman because she knew that that's something that she could work with, you know? We've all, we've got to, to work with what we got, right? <laughs> I, that's actually a part of the movie that I didn't um, resonate with, but the woman has said that that's her beauty was what derailed her. I, I think that's what opened the doors because she used it very strategically. And for you know, she said she thought it was a, a curse in part of the way because that's what she was known for. So as she got older, it just became more difficult to live, live up to those standards. But so many doors opened to her and was able to go into so many different rooms because she became that famous star that wouldn't she wouldn't have had access to that either way. And if we put it, you know, we're going to get scientific here, in a control group <laughs> versus her, who else became famous as a woman for her inventions at that time? You know, that, that's still so minimal. So the fact that, we, that the story even came out is because of her role as of in the films, or else this would have been disappeared completely in history, is my opinion. So Hetty, of course, was known as her invention for the missile guided torpedo and also frequency hopping. So tell us a little bit about your different three specific industries, but tell us a little bit about technology and how it has helped guide you in your career. One or two of you, please answer. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, it's, it's all about, it's always been about healthcare, and that's my industry. I'm a physician, I don't practice, but I've always been interested in business and how to how tech works in health so for me it was just all you know th and I've been in this field for 20 plus years totally and I just see things over time where it's like okay what is the male a, a real medical problem out there in the field and what can I do to create something that actually can work in that so I'm always looking for various solutions for problems that I see and during my travels and so for me, I'm not that tech gadgety person, that health tech type of person, but what my tech is, is medical diagnostics, it's medical equipment. And those are the things that I try to improve upon so they can be used in different environments, particularly in developing countries. So that's what I focus on. And it's sort of my, what I love to do, and I'm always that curious person as she was, and wanted to know how can I improve and make things better for people that are challenged in any sort of way. And so that's kind of where my focus has always been in tech. For me, uh, technology has brought me into 
different industries that I think I would have otherwise had trouble entering. I wouldn't be in public media today if I wasn't a software engineer. Um, I've, I've worked in agriculture, I've worked in finance, and bringing uh, solutions to uh, these type of business environments and the technology, leading with technology um, has, has been something that um, I've found opportunity in, in, in our daily lives and uh, that, that I think is an opportunity that we need to share you know, more with others and with kids these days is that you know, the traditional careers are changing but techn leading with technology, we can really um, you know, allow ourselves to change with it. Did we have any more audience questions? Yes, straight up. Uh, if if you could speak perhaps to, Hedy Lamar was an artist, uh, and to that extent, perhaps her ability to turn an idea into a business model. There's even her second husband says, I'm, "I'm an artist, not a business person." Whereas you contrast her with Lucille Ball, who also figured prominently in the film, who was an extremely successful business person. And so, if you could speak to how much of your time do you spend? taking the idea and nurturing the idea and then turning that into the business concept that actually is profitable and is there an inherent conflict in that process? Oh goodness, so that's a great question. <laughs> you know, I've always been sort of that entrepreneurial minded person ever since probably since high school I had my first business and I was actually you know had this idea of okay I have all these kids in the neighborhood and their parents cannot take them to their soccer games gymnastics but I have a car and if they pay me I can drive them to all their events and then get paid to do it you know and so for you know so that's been my life is always coming up with these really crazy ideas and I would ask sort of my family and friends what do you think about this and if it was a good idea, they would say, explore it, do more with it. Or if they hung up on me, I knew it was bad. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of my way of doing this. But I've always, you know, my business now, Fortis, is not my first company. This is probably my fifth, <laughs> you know, and some have worked and some have, no, you know, have done good and done well or not. But I always looked at myself and said, well, I'm very good at taking an idea, researching it, and then starting a business. But my problem is the sometimes that business side of things, because I get stuck in the research and trying to figure out how to make this thing perfect. But okay, when it comes to the books, it's like, ooh, I don't know how to do all of that. And so now with this business, now I see after all those years of kind of failing and kind of halfway doing things and figuring it out, now I'm a much better business woman than I've ever been with all the other five different businesses that I've had. So it takes a learning process to make that happen, but it's just something you have to get comfortable with and be able to do and sort of, you know, at some point I'm like, should I just stick with the ideas and start something and automatically hand it off? But then I thought, no, I can become a better businesswoman. Let me try this and let me learn. And that's where I am now. But it took a long time to get there. So I, I probably have just a tiny different perspective from there, and this is because I've been a, a coach and I've taught over a thousand entrepreneurs to go through this process. And uh, first, it's, it's a mindset. And second is we're all born different kinds of geniuses. I, uh, I think we're all talented in different ways as humans. And there's this um, famous quote that is attributed to Albert Einstein, and we're not sure if he actually said it, but, but it says, if you ask a fish to climb a tree, it will live its entire life thinking it's stupid. Okay, and what does that mean? A fish is really good at being a fish. It's not good at being a monkey or anything else that's good at climbing a tree. And why do I bring that up? I bring that up is because, again, we all have different forms of geniuses. And Hetty was, as you pointed out, an amazing artist and not a very good business person. That doesn't mean she was bad at what she did, but this is why in business and the way I teach my founders is if you are a solo founder, and you can't get even another person to join your team, 
the likelihood of your business exploding to trying to sell your gadget to a million people is very slim, okay? If you can't convince another person to believe you, that's really hard. And why do I say that? It's important to have a team because your team members are going to take on different elements of your business that is not your genius. Uh, there's another movie that I also recommend uh, that's on Netflix, you can find it. it's called uh, Tesla. It's the same thing. He was a brilliant inventor, horrible business person, Kay Westinghouse, and a whole bunch of other, other people took advantage of him. So this has nothing, to, it's, this is not a gender thing. It's just we all have different geniuses. And also, I, t I tell all of my entrepreneurs, your job in the first eight weeks, at least when they're with me, is to be crazy mad scientists. What do I mean by that? Is we run experiments constantly. You know, if you're, a lot of people are afraid, they'll, make a product and they're just scared of putting it out on Facebook or creating a, a campaign online, a Kickstarter, we're like, well, what if nobody wants it? Don't you want to find out now <laughs> instead of five years from now when you've already built the app and put in $10,000? So too many people think, you know, if I build it, they will come. Wrong! No, run, run small little campaigns on Facebook, on Craigslist. There are ways of using technology nowadays with a little bit of money that will tell you yes or no on that specific business idea. It has nothing to do with the person. Too many people have confused the idea of it failed versus I failed. And those are two completely different things. Thank you so much. So as you can tell, we have three brilliant, very intelligent women up here who, are, who have been great business owners and great in technology. So I know that one of the things that we can probably agree with Hetty is that she wasn't extremely comfortable with leaning in or grabbing a seat at the table when it came to the technology side of things. Doesn't seem like we have a problem with these ladies. <laughs> so one of the quotes that I was um, given by my first boss at a company was, if all the seats at the table are filled, grab a folding chair. So she always said that. Tell us a little bit about, in your experience, how you've had to, um, if, you, if the door was closed, go through the window or grab a seat or lean in um, when you felt like the opportunity was not presented to you. Um, yeah, I think I touched on a little bit uh, being a, a female as a software engineer, uh, not being a very popular choice among other women. Um, oftentimes when you're the only one woman in the room. Um, you know, the thing, when you grab the seat at the table, uh, you have to do so gently. Uh, they don't, uh, they, they often, you know, will react to us differently than they will react to someone who, uh, unconscious bias or not, uh, they see as, you know, more of their peer. Um, so when you grab that seat at the table, you also have to work very hard to persuade and convince them that you belong there. And you, and you also feel that you have to continually prove that you belong there, I feel. And uh, that never, I feel it goes away from, from the way that you look at things, even if, you know, your, your perception doesn't change as much, even if you eventually just own your seat at the table. We all kind of live with that imposter syndrome that builds up from, from the times. And I think that, you know, it's, it's something that, as long as we recognize that, um, we're able to combat that. But it's it never, like I said, never goes away. And you face it on a daily basis. Um, it, it made me think of, um, how we're treated at different places in, in, in the room and you're talking about uh, being gentle with how we, we come in. And uh, it's, it's a very tricky situation for a, a woman in the room and I actually uh, I, I want you to speak a little bit on this because you have little ones at home. So I, I'm, I'm not a mother yet and I bow down. Uh, to those of you who are and who are also in a professional field because that I know that can't be easy I can barely take care of myself so m you know making sure another person stays alive is very important <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, and it made me I, I love movies as well and if you haven't seen Car Captain Marvel go watch it I watched it last night I'm not gonna give it anything away uh, 
but there's this one line that she says to a specific character that says, I don't have anything to prove to you. And that's all cool and dandy when you're already a badass and you can kill everyone on the planet. Uh, but for women like us who are barely going into a room or even if we've already been you know, extremely qualified this happened to me actually not that long ago in a contract here in Nebraska. Uh, There's a room full of men, board of directors, going over qualifications for a program that I was running. And their only comeback for what I was doing in the program that I was intending to run was, well, what does she know? You know, she, she's coming from Silicon Valley. And, you know, what does she know about entrepreneurship in Nebraska? And uh, it just makes you scratch your head a little bit because you think, hmm, you don't want to learn best practices from the mecca of entrepreneurship in the freaking world? <laughs> okay, bye-bye. So, and, and this is going back to very, very small-minded people who are just afraid, okay? They're afraid of anything that looks different than them, that sounds different. I have an accent. I speak Spanish fluently, and I'm very proud of that. So when people, when we walk into the room, and I have that, the double whammy, and we have some African-American ladies here as well, as the double whammy is I'm a double minority. I'm Latina, and I'm a woman. So guess what? I know that when people see my resume and they see Hernandez, 50% of the time, I am immediately withdrawn from the qualification pool for any project I want to work on. I just know that's a fact. That's just what happens, okay? It's not my imagination. And then another thing is even if they see my education at the top, which is from a very prestigious university, like all of these ladies, they don't care because they just think, oh, she got in under some whatever law. We're like, actually, I graduated in three and a half years at the top of my class with honors. Hmm. They don't look into those things just because they see or think it's something else. So th this conversation can go on for several hours, as you can see. But this is these are some of the things that we have to deal with. And for the ladies out there, I know you don't. I, you already know this. It's extra exhausting for us because we have to work double the time and effort to prove that we belong when we shouldn't have to do that in the first place. And then we still have to get the work done. So that's part of the situation. And go home and make sure your munchkins don't die because they have to be fed. <laughs> Which is why what you did is really smart. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Really um, I'm the moderator, but OK. I can tell you a little bit. I, I I'll just, my time. I'll, I'll just, I'll just tell, tell you a little bit about um, my experience in moving from the corporate world to the business world. So being in the corporate world, I was used to being the only female at the table and the only African-American um, in the room. Um, so much so that the first project that I worked on at ConAgra um, was a... Um, it was a healthy choice, low sodium meal that we were coming out with. And the person that I was working with who had graduated from UNL, we were around the same age, and she looked at me and she said, you are the first African-American I've ever had a conversation with. And I said, and she was from, I, I'm going to get it wrong, Albany or Albany or something like that, Nebraska, a Albany. That's where she was from. And I'm like, but you went to the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And she said, yeah, but like, I never had to talk to you people. Never. Never had I, I never had to talk in, to a person, an African American before, and I just was floored right that. So, um, so I was used to that environment, and then, so I was used to having very soft skills and the HR perspective, and then moving into um, an environment with childcare. And now you are, you need to have a different set of skills, right? Because you need to come across a little bit more with some empathy. You need to come across um, with some more communication. And so it was it was a, a different seat at the table 
if you will, going from corporate America, cl- trying to climb that ladder, and then going over to a child care, which is a woman dominated industry, coming in, being six foot tall, buying a company from what was previously ran by a Caucasian female in her 50s. And it because it was a private sale and it was an acquisition, I signed the paperwork 7717, showed up 71017, and said, I'm your new boss. And so to come across a little bit um, softer to my families to say, hey, look, I don't know anything about child care, but you don't know that. But your child is still going to be safe, out of harm's way. And to come across to my staff, um, I have a staff of 23 now, to come across to my staff and my teachers and say, no, you're not going to lose your job. We're going to get through this together and, you know, be able to to relate to those people. So two different types of seats at the table. Um, at the time, I had just had a baby, and now I've just had another baby, and so piling those on. And then I have a third child at home who is 34 years old as well. So... <laughs> trying to combine that whole um that whole gamut do we have how are we doing on time we're good good. how many minutes do we have about Uh, okay more audience questions for us yes in the blue well that last uh round right there kind of answered my original question. Um, I'm from the Silicon Valley. Um, so I was going to spin it with what were some of your difficulties coming from a larger market to a smaller market? Not that Omaha isn't burgeoning lately with uh, tech and the schools and the, the different programs that they have available. But um, rather than focus on the negative, wh- what about a positive coming from a larger market? Because I, I know some of you came from larger cities or Silicon Valley and you probably travel to larger markets in your business dealings, right? So what, what would be a positive co- coming from those areas to like the Midwest? Yeah, so for me, you know, I moved here by way of Maryland, Tanzania, Kenya, and Atlanta to here. So there's a little story behind <laughs> all of that. So I've, you know, been all over the place and, you know, I came here to work on a particular project um, health insurance so I am spending some time doing that but also still running this this business and running a team in Africa as well and so here what I find differently let's say from I compare it to Maryland because there you know my business I sell to the federal government well you know in DC that's all federal government so you can go down the street have a conversation with the procurement officer and get the deal done you know here it's like okay where do I go but you know what, nowadays, you can just pick up the phone and call someone in his email. It's quieter here, you know, you can get around a little bit more and the community of other medical equipment suppliers and other government contractors are a little bit smaller. So you're not always kind of fighting everybody in like the DC area, it's just more of a community here, which I've experienced. And it's actually enjoyable to do that. It's refreshing in a sense to me. It's been amazing in several senses. So one, one of the things that I notice is and you should all be very proud of this because I know you are, is the commitment to a very high work ethic. And in Silicon Valley or California, everybody works a lot, but they quit things constantly and they move around. So here, like as an example, I'll I'll start a program or start a boot camp for two weeks that's virtual and almost everyone stays in the class for those eight weeks versus California, I'll lose like a third of the class after week two because they're like, ah, something came up. And uh, that, that's just, you know, it, there's very, they're very laissez-faire about it. And here I really appreciate sort of like the work ethic and the commitment level of Nebraskans to say, I'm going to stick this through and not quit it. And they might realize halfway through, hey, this isn't for me, <coughs> but they realize somebody else can learn something from it. So they follow through, and I, and I love that. And also, I met the love of my life here, so that's the most important thing. (laughs) On technology app called Bumble. (laughs) So talk about technology changing your life, right? Questions from the audience? I think I saw a hand in the back. Um, there was uh, some discussion, I think, in the first or second round uh, about everyone's own type of genius. 
and um, I think as we get older we kind of settle into what we are good at and I know a lot of things I'm not good at and I was wondering if you ladies had some advice uh, about someone who maybe grew up a little bit too mired in the Midwest and our culture and how to raise um, children uh, specifically female children who are interested in science and what auxiliary skills can I help with and is it more of a matter of putting them in front of folks like yourselves or is there education opportunities like what advice do you have for parents who may not be the type of genius that helps a woman succeed in technology I think I can uh, take that one a little bit um, for one I, I'd say check out Mystery Coast Society the programs are excellent I've been an instructor and a board member with them and and the work is excellent and I think having the uh, role, model, role models there is really important. I think as a parent, and I have a 19-year-old uh, gender non-binary um, assigned female at birth uh, daughter myself. So I've, I've raised uh, a girl, um, and I know the challenges that they faced. And um, I think it's all about a mindset. And I see uh, my niece and nephew are visiting me right now, funny enough. And I see in them, like, it's um, a lot of it is a difference between, you know, being a boy and a girl. And I think that we need to recognize those biases in ourselves and as adults and not, you know, not ingrain that into our children, you know, and, and try to combat those biases and um, give all of our children a growth mindset and, and help them recognize their potential. And I think especially with women, um, fear of failure is a big one that we face a lot. Um, it's, I think you said it earlier, I mean, it's not you who's failed, it's like your thing failed. And just pick it up, you know? Maybe they fired you, get up and go. It's, you know what, maybe that wasn't for you. Um, I think this is the, the mindset that we all, you know, we need to all have, but I think especially as women, um, we feel very judged by our failures, and that's something that we can really help our children with. I can also answer that. I have two daughters, and I would say to um, someone who identifies as Caucasian to not be afraid to be the only one because I think that um, certainly us three have been the only one and are constantly the only one. So the only one in your class um, throughout most of college, I was a cell biology uh, major, the being the only one in my graduate school program, it's just, it's, you're just the only one. And especially in Omaha, Nebraska, some of the neighborhoods that might have um, a newer home that I might wanna purchase, and I might be the only African-American um, out of 208 houses in my neighborhood there's two families one family moved to here from um, UP because he got a job here and that was a neighborhood the realtor showed them and then us and this 2019 so I would say to your children and to you as the parents and grandparents of those children don't be afraid to be the only one I mean there's some great opportunities and some great experiences um, certainly downtown area but also in the north Omaha area also in south of Omaha area and if if you walk into those um, to those places, you know, just act like you've been there. Is what my mom, who's sitting over there, would say. Act like you've been there before, right? Um, yeah, I think it is challenging for your children to have a diverse experience in Omaha. It's not impossible, though. And I'll end with. Uh, I live in Gretna and we have some really great schools and people always tell me how great the schools are and I say well when my child turns six and has to go to kindergarten we'll see how great the schools are for her because it does not matter if the education and the opportunities are there if her social and emotional experience is going to be compromised because someone's going to be asking to touch her hair or wondering you know where she came from or you know asking her all of these strange questions it might not be in a comfortable environment for her. So I would say ask the questions, ask the questions, um, especially if you have a friend that is not of a, of, of a different ethnic background. Ask those questions, welcome those questions, but then also welcome that person into your inner circle as well to make them feel more comfortable. Yeah, okay, audience questions? I'm just gonna give one quick. Um, oh yes, Emmy. not even really a comment, just a quick resource. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the new Fort Campus for Metro. Yeah. They have this new, huge, amazing prototype lab 
And what that means is they have 3D printers in there, they have laser cutters, a whole bunch of really cool adult toys that also apply to little kids. So they have different programs and you can get like a quarter pass, I think for like $20. I mean, they make it very accessible for the community. So even just exposing your children, whether or not you think they're excited about technology or whether or not, I mean, they're the ones that are gonna be taking care of us in a few years, right? So <laughs> like just exposing them to those kind of areas and labs and letting them touch things and it's okay if they break, right? They have insurance, it's fine. Uh, because we're taught as children at home, if something's expensive, don't touch it, right? Because it's gonna break. And over here, they're encouraged to play with things, break them, and start over. And that sort of mindset of like, oh, I'm just playing and experimenting, they grow up thinking that that's how you build things, which is, that is how you build things. That's how you build wonderful companies. And in right in the middle in the blue. I was just going to expand on what she had just said. Um, in addition to the campus, um, there's do space at 72nd and Dodge. There's um, AIM Exchange, AKA Brain Exchange, that has STEM programs, uh, different classes of technology uh, downtown, Collaboratory and Papillion, and actually 4-H, uh, believe it or not, they've expanded uh, to include quite a bit of STEM uh, activities as well. So there's all sorts of opportunities throughout the, the uh, region for you know, kids in general, but also girls and people of different ethnicities and whatnot, so. Awesome, thank you. Any other audience questions? Yes, sir. Having kicked around this earth for a few decades, uh, being a veteran, the son of a veteran, born overseas, spent a lot of years in the medical field with predominantly women, worked in other areas with other women, having seen and experienced a lot of things. Gender's not the only issue. Uh, you know, it's gender, age, nationality, anything under the sun. If you're the odd one out, you tend to get looked at and ignored to a certain extent. You know, the, the group of young people will kind of shy away from the thoughts of an older person. The, the younger person will get shunned by the older folks. You know, guys with gals, gals with guys, um, you know, it, just the whole nine yards. Anyone and everyone has the potential to experience and have to deal with different obstacles to overcome and to learn to gain confidence in yourself and seek help wherever you can find it. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Or any final thoughts by the yeah. panel? I wanted to end with um, asking, so um, Hedy Lamar um, in the film, she said that she wanted to be re remembered as someone who contributed to mankind. So, and I know as we're constantly on a daily writing our own biography, so at this point in your life, what would you be like for p others to remember you as? <laughs> I'm still writing this book. <laughs> I'm on page two, you know? So I think for me, you know, it, I guess it's simple enough at this point is, is, you know, someone who made a difference and who was really true to herself. I mean, I'm a kind of a quirky, you know, science curious person and have always been looked at as she's different. And for many years, it's always been like, okay, maybe I am different and maybe I don't know what I'm doing. And nuts you know but I just had to stay true to who I am and just be self-aware and just keep who be true to me and what I wanted to do out of life and for me it's sort of also working with others and it's just making that difference and making an impact and particularly in healthcare. if I can just one life I'm okay that's all I want but I still need to write this book and I need to keep going Sandy Emmy um, I, I would say that for me, in the last few years, I realized that my resume is completely irrelevant and how I see myself as a human and how I interact in the world because my accomplishments mean nothing if I'm not just a good person to someone else. So there's that phrase, you know, it's like, what's the phrase? No one cares about what you 
think until they, and what you know until they know how much you care, yes. or something like that. I have, and I'll just tell you a very quick anecdote. Uh, this was the day I realized I was not a business coach. Um, I was running a program, I can't tell you what country because it'll give away a little bit about the details and for the privacy of this person, I don't give that away. Um, but this person went through an eight week program with me that was for tech startups. And at their graduation, we were at an event and she sat next to me and she said, hey, you know, um, can we talk? And I said, yeah, what's up? And she said, you know, I, I thank God that I got to sit next to you after this. I had a, a class of like almost 100. And I said, oh yeah, I was like, I thought it was a funny thing for her to say. I said, tell me more. And she said, you don't know this, but I was struggling going through a divorce and all these other horrible things during, during the class. Like I had no idea all this was happening. And she said, and there was one moment uh, towards the end of the class where I thought that I was just, it was raining. She's like, I was just gonna drive my car off the cliff. And uh, she told me, but I remembered something you said during the course. She said, so I decided not to. And like, it hit me, right? In that moment, she was telling me that I, because of something that I had said, unbeknownst to me, she had chosen not to commit suicide. And I went back, to, we cried in each other's arms for like 20 minutes. I went back to my hotel room. My dress was drenched in her tears and my tears. And I cried for another four hours in the hotel room, realizing what had just happened. And I realized in that moment, it really doesn't matter <laughs> what I say or do on a professional level. That's the mark I want to make in the world to have that human connection with anyone I can encounter. Did she say what it was you said? She did not specifically. <laughs> no. And honestly, I probably wouldn't have remembered. I ramble so much, as you can tell, that uh, she she never said specifically what it was. <coughs> but thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. uh, no, because. In my heart, I know it wasn't the words. It was what I expressed in my energy of caring, if that makes sense. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily specific words. Yeah. I don't know how we can uh, follow up that story, <laughs> but uh, I really couldn't think of anything that I want to be remembered by. But I know that I have encountered things in my life that I've chosen. I am not going to be remembered by that. And, and one in particular was a financial advisor trying to sell me life insurance once. He uh, had literally told me I needed to put on my big girl pants and get this life insurance. And he's, he started to define uh, my self-worth by my income. And I ran out of that office faster than anything you'd seen. And I decided that that was definitely something that I did not define myself by. And that, as you said, the impact that you make in the world is what really matters to me. Well, as you can see um, from the film, Hetty has left her mark on the world with some of her technology contributions, um, so much so that it has allowed us to stay connected. Um, all of our panelists are on social media if you want to stay after and greet them. Um, any uh, last parting words from, from Angie or from any of the, the audience members? Yes. I'm not technological at all. <laughs> okay. another person. Wow. So Hetty Lamar had that aspect yeah. in her life along with the technology. Right. There was something in that spark of life in her that mm -hmm. went on. And this was a marvelous wow. film mm -hmm. to show that. I'm just so grateful that I got to meet this panel of amazing, brilliant women and get to stay in touch with them. And please help me give them a hand for their contributions. <laughs>